Третий форум социальных инноваций регионов продолжает свою работу. И мы готовы снова обратиться к опыту иностранных. So we continue our session and we are again turning to our uh, foreign experts. Please pay attention that the next lecture will be in English. And for your convenience, you can make use of headsets for simultaneous translation. One of the key uh, topics of the second forum held in Krasnogorsk in 2017 was development of non-commercial organizations. Today we continue this subject and please learn more about the next speaker. Автор бестселлера и нового манифеста некоммерческого сектора «Неблаготворительность». Создатель таких успешных благотворительных инициатив, как трехдневные пешие прогулки в поддержку людей с раком молочной железы и многодневные велопробеги в пользу исследований и профилактики ВИЧ. За 9 лет существования этих проектов удалось собрать более полумиллиарда долларов США. Модели и методы, которые создал Паллота, теперь используются десятками благотворительных организаций по всему миру. Его знаменитые выступления на конференции TED в 2013 году посмотрели более чем 4 миллиона раз. Это одно из 50 самых мотивирующих выступлений на TED за все время существования конференции. Сегодня на третьем форуме социальных инноваций регионов Дэн Паллота с лекцией «Неблаготворительность. Как ограничения работы некоммерческих организаций ослабляют их потенциал». Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Dan Pallotta. Hello, Dan. Welcome to Moscow. How are you? Today is the perfect weather outside, and did you have time to walk around the city? What do you think about it in the context of social it's, innovations? Of it's course? beautiful. It's beautiful. It's my first time to Moscow. It's my first time to Russia. So I, I don't have a lot of time, but I got to go to uh, Red Square today, and... Uh, go over the bridge and see some of the beautiful churches, and it's beautiful. So great, thank you. And you know, it's a great honor for us to uh, see you here today, and thank you for being here. And now it's the best moment to give you the floor and to start the most interesting part of your performance, I guess. Okay, great. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Palota, your applause. Thank you. Dan Palota, please welcome him. How are you? You good? Having a good day? Long day, right? It's a long day? Well, I want to thank everybody associated with the conference for inviting me to be here today. And thanks to all of you for coming out to listen to what I have to say. This is, this is the first time I've ever been to, to Russia. And it's sort of a dream for me, you know? I, I, I grew up in the 1960s, and that was the era of the Cold War. And... Uh, to think that I would ever be able to come to Russia and we could talk together about how to make the world a better place is kind of a fantasy. So dreams come true, right? Miracles really happen. Miracles really do come true. I want to spend our... Oh, I should tell you, first of all, I, I come from the, the northeastern part of the United States. I come from uh, Massachusetts, a little town called Topsfield that's about 20 miles north of... Boston, and uh, I think the climate is similar to Moscow. We have a lot of snow in the winter. We have a hot summer. We have a nice spring. Um, I go for a three-mile walk every morning and get to go by these beautiful pastures, and there's a lot of horses, and there are cows that I see every morning. These are two cows that I say hello to every single morning. They speak French, Russian, and English, these two cows. Um, so I want to spend our time today asking a big question, which is, what if everything we've been taught to think about charity and about philanthropy and about how a nonprofit should operate, what if it's all wrong? What if it's actually undermining the ability of our nonprofit organizations to play a critical role in solving some of the gigantic social problems that we're trying to solve in the world? My career in this arena began back when I was in college. You know, I was, uh, I was studying world hunger for the first time. I was studying development economics, and I was learning about how many people die of hunger and hunger-related disease every year. You know, 20 
million people dying of hunger and hunger-related disease, two-thirds of them children around the world, mostly dying of diarrhea. And we used to do these little fundraisers in college to raise money for Oxfam. Oxfam is an international development organization. And we would raise about $2,000 in this fall and $2,000 in the spring. And up against the gigantic scale of this social problem, that became very frustrating to me. You know, those seemed like very small amounts of money up against a very big social problem. And I wanted to do something big, but I didn't have any big ideas. And everybody in the room knows what that's like. When you have a lot of passion and a lot of fire and a lot of commitment, but you don't seem to have the idea. And so then the summer before my senior year, I heard about these two guys who were bicycling across America to raise money for cancer research. And I realized that I hadn't been thinking big enough, that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to take a large group of students on a bike ride across the entire continental United States. So that next summer, uh, 39 of us got on a plane at Logan Airport in Boston and we took a six hour flight to Seattle, Washington. And then we spent the next nine and a half weeks pedaling our bicycles 4,256 miles across the entire continental United States. And this was what the group looked like. And when we got back into Cambridge, we felt tired and depleted, you know, spiritually depleted, physically depleted, emotionally depleted, like we had done the most you could possibly do for a cause that we cared about deeply, and more than that, we could not have done. And then I moved to Los Angeles, and it was the, it was the height of the AIDS epidemic in the United States, and back in those days, there weren't, weren't these drugs called protease inhibitors. And so people would die very quickly, you know. If somebody got an HIV diagnosis, they might be dead six or seven weeks later. And people were losing their fathers and their brothers and their sons. And there was nothing big you could do about it. You know, you could put a little red ribbon on your jacket. Well, that wasn't what you wanted to do when you were burying your friends at very young ages. And so I never forgot the power of that cross-country bike ride, the power of a journey as a metaphor for so many things. And I thought the AIDS crisis needs some powerful vehicle for people to express all of this love and all of this grief and all of this sorrow. And so we created this event. And it was called California AIDS Ride. It was a seven-day bike ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And you had to go the whole seven days. You had to go the whole 600 miles. You had to sleep in a tent every night, and you had to raise a minimum of one thousand. Excuse me, a minimum of two thousand dollars in order to do it. Now that was different because up until then, these biking events and these walking events let people go, no matter how much they raised. You raised a little, that's okay. You raised a lot, that's okay, which was wonderfully democratic. But it wasn't a very powerful way to raise money. You know, it wasn't a very powerful revenue model. And we didn't advertise the AIDS rides to cyclists or to athletes. We advertised them to average people who had it in their hearts to do something extraordinary. So we had the craziest looking group of people pedaling their bikes from San Francisco to Los Angeles. I mean, rear ends of all dimensions and breathing capacities of all types and you know, all kinds of ragtag outfits. And that's what made it really beautiful. You know, to see some 72-year-old woman who's terrified of riding her bike down the coast of California. But her son has just told her she, he's HIV positive. She has promised him that she's going to ride. And there is absolutely nothing that's going to stop her. And story after story after story like that. Well, that first AIDS bike ride netted a little over a million dollars, which was much more than we had expected it to raise. So we began expanding the AIDS rides all over the United States, and we did them in Texas and in Florida and in New York and in uh, Minnesota and in Chicago, and then we began doing them across the Rocky Mountains, and then we did one from Amsterdam to Paris, and then we did one in Canada. And we started looking at the 
Потом мы занялись раком груди. Люди теряли своих дочерей, матерей. И ничего мы не могли сделать с этим. В США вы можете надеть, приколоть к себе розовый, розовую ленточку. У вас это есть в России? Так вот мы это делали в США. Мы организовали пробег 10 километров. А почему всегда мы 10 километров организовывали? Поэтому мы взяли и организовали поход в течение трех дней, 60 миль. Мы спали в палатках и мы заработали полторы тысячи долларов для того, чтобы это сделать. Так вот, что касается рака груди, то мы в первый день уже... В первые три дня заработали 4 миллиона долларов. Мы начали расширяться. Три дня, посвященные борьбе с раком груди, мы охватили все Соединенные Штаты. И через 9 лет у нас 182 тысячи человек участвовало в этих мероприятиях. 581 миллион долларов мы собрали. То есть больше долларов мы собрали, нежели в отношении любых других компаний. И мы провели э, кейс исследования по социальным предприятиям. Все основано на простой идее. То есть, когда э, речь заходит о вопросах, которые действительно важны нам, будь то нищета, бездомные, э, рак и так далее, люди делают даже больше того, что, что они думали могут сделать. И их никто не просит об этом. Они делают то, что они могут и чего не могут. Как выглядят эти мероприятия? Ну, некоторые были весьма масштабные. Порой у нас было 6 тысяч человек, участников в этих мероприятиях, в 10 городах. Это вот один только пример. И у нас в каждом городе может быть до 6 таких район, районов. И мы... Мы построили большую компанию, у нас 16 офисов по всей, всему США, вот штаб-квартира в Лос-Анджелесе. Мы построили это из контейнеров. Тогда даже не было сертификации, например, на свинец. И у нас были офисы в этих контейнерах. Мы просто на погрузчике поднимали этот контейнер и начинали в нем работать так вот тогда мы получили уникальную возможность мы узнали что думают люди о, об этом о нашей деятельности и вот оттуда я и черпал свои идеи Но прежде чем мы будем говорить об идеях давайте проведем сравнение российские некоммерческие организации и некоммерческие организации в других стран, включая США. Что касается источников денег, в США примерно 79% денег, которые получает неправительственная организация, мы получаем от людей. Примерно 5% от корпораций и 16% от фондов, как, например, Форд Фонда или Форд Гейтса. В России, интересно, примерно то же самое, примерно 70% денег идет от людей, 30% от корпораций. Поэтому действительно, если вы хотите расти в этом секторе филантропии в России, то что вам надо, то источник... Средств для вас – это люди. Теперь, что касается доверия. 65% людей в России считают, что они не верят в то, что деньги, которые они дают непрофессиональным организациям, дойдут до тех людей, которые в этом нуждаются. В США 70% говорят о том, что непрофессиональные организации значительную долю денег просто растрачивают. Поэтому вопрос о доверии – это очень важный вопрос. Люди не верят, что деньги достигают нуждающих, тех, кто нуждается в них. 
70% в США считают, что эти деньги не достигают тех людей, которые в них нуждаются. Теперь, что касается размера сектора. Население в России примерно 145 миллионов, 140 неправительственных, некоммерческих организаций, примерно 70 миллиардов долларов бюджет, процент граждан, которые дают деньги на благотворительную деятельность 53%. Это, об этом говорят данные фонда благотворительной помощи. Но Мексика, примерно столько же населения, 123 миллиона лишь. 10 тысяч неправительственных организаций, бюджет примерно 2 миллиарда долларов каждый год, и 25% людей дают деньги неправительственным и некоммерческим организациям. Австралия. Меньше населения, 25 миллионов человек, 56 тысяч неправительственных организаций, примерно 8 миллиардов долларов уходит в год, как в России, и 56% дают деньги некормическим организациям. В США 370 миллионов человек, примерно полтора миллиона непростых организаций, 410 миллиардов долларов ежегодный бюджет, примерно 56% американцев дают деньги на деятельность некоммерческой организации. Вы помните, примерно 75% этого, из этих миллиардов долларов, поступает от отдельных людей. Если вы считаете, что для того, чтобы развивать фантропический сектор в России, нужны корпорации, чтобы они давали больше денег, нет, это не так. Ключ к успеху, ключ к росту филантропии здесь, в США – это люди. Благотворительная деятельность в США огромная по сравнению с любой другой страной в мире. Но потому что это огромный сектор, это не значит, что мы все правильно делаем. И я думаю, что мы много ошибок допустили в США. Я хочу сейчас вам рассказать о тех ошибках, которые мы допускали в США. И вы начинаете их делать и в России. Есть возможность здесь сделать все правильно. Но прежде чем эти ошибки станут институционными, пока это не превратится в привычку на, в, в большом масштабе. Филантропия в России молодая, и поэтому есть возможность все правильно сделать с самого начала. Итак, социальная статистика. У меня будет по статистике США, некоторая статистика российская, но не обращайте внимания на то, что это статистика у США. Вы себя спросите, динамика, которую я описываю в отношении США, идентична ли той динамике, которая у вас здесь в России есть? Не считав США, примерно 11-15% населения с 70-х годов, сейчас примерно 14% населения США это живет в нищете. Не получается у меня вот переключать. В России 13-22%. Я должен быть... Я не то, что на вас не обращаю внимания, просто я должен быть рядом с компьютером. 13-22% в России население живет на счете. На счете это зависит, откуда вы берете статистику. 18,5 миллионов людей живут в глубокой нищете в США. То есть на 50% ниже официального порога бедности. 21% детей в США живут в семье, где доход ниже уровня нищеты. И многие считают, что наш порог нищеты слишком консервативен. И цифра здесь может быть 40% детей в Америке живут в семьях, где доход ниже уровня официального уровня бедности. В России цифра примерно такая же. 5 миллионов детей сегодня в США живут, в, на, на, 5, на 5 миллионов больше детей живет в бедности, чем тогда, когда я был ребенком. 14% в 92 году, в 2003 году, 14% прошло 11 лет, и все равно цифра такая же. Но трудно сравнить яблоки с яблоками. Что касается России, уровень неграмотности в России 
Ну, я не знаю, как вы с эту статистику сравните. Уровень э, самоубийств на 4% увеличился за последние 12 лет в США. Теперь это 13,8% э, на 100 тысяч человек. В России еще хуже. Как вам известно, за последние 10 лет эта цифра выросла 16 человек на каждые 1000, 100 тысяч. Рак груди. Примерно 45 тысяч умерло в США в 1992 году, в прошлом году примерно 40 тысяч. В России случаи увеличиваются с 32 на 100 тысяч человек, с 33 до 47 человек на каждые 100 тысяч человек в 2013 году. Вы можете эту статистику проанализировать, как, например, статистика рака груди в США, и можете сказать, ну, ситуация улучшается с точки зрения процента населения. Да, но очень медленно. И не так перемены должны осуществляться. Не на это мы надеялись 45 лет назад. Если кто-то скажет, это тот, как будут выглядеть эти графики еще через 20 лет. Некоторые могут сказать, это несправедливо. Не всю эту статистику цитировать о нищете, по нищете, по раку груди, по самоубийствам по, э, и так далее. Но эти проблемы в конечном счете являются ответственностью вашего правительства. И возникает вопрос, почему некоммерческий сектор здесь тогда присутствует? Для того, чтобы просто показать это все? Для того, чтобы люди хорошо себя почувствовали? Для того, чтобы служить своей рода повязкой на этой огромной проблеме. Нет ли у нас мечты просто искоренить эти проблемы? Google изменил информационную ситуацию. Apple подрывал сектор за сектором. Alibaba, Amazon изменили шопинг. Facebook изменил тренды общения людей. И мы видим совсем молодых людей, которые мечтают, имеют э, смелые мечты. Э, они ничем не ограничены. Но если мы соединим эти мечты с капиталом, у нас будет мощная комбинация, которая изменит мир, который мы знаем сегодня. Изменит навсегда. Изменит быстро. Э, вопрос, который э, перед нами стоит... Перед всеми, кто работает в некоммерческом секторе, кто заинтересован в некоммерческом секторе, вопрос такой. Неправительственный сектор не, не может ли он также мечтать, так как мечтал Apple, например, мечтать искоренить хотя бы одну из социальных проблем в нашей жизни, и чтобы были ресурсы для этого? И критическая часть проблемы – это масштаб. Социальные вызовы, они массивные по своим масштабам. Будь то дети без родителей, нищета, бездомные. Мы видим, что огромное количество населения сталкивается с этими проблемами. Проблемы массивны по своему масштабу. И неправильные организации, они миниатюрны по сравнению с этими гигантскими проблемами. И мы можем иметь наилучшие намерения, но тем не менее у нас такая, такое мышление, что наши организации, они маленькие, они не могут решить проблемы. У нас два правила. У нас правило одно для неправительственного сектора и другое правило для остальной экономики. Так вот эти правила, они подрывают возможность некоммерческих организаций изменить мир. Мы можем рассмотреть пять различных областей. Первое – это э, то, что вы получаете в бизнесе. Чем больше ценностей вы производите, тем больше денег вы можете заработать. Безгранично. Э, не знаю, как в России, но в США, если вы, например, занимаете недвижимостью, продаете дома, вам платят на основе каждого дома, который вы продали. Ты продал дом, получил деньги. Больше домов продал, больше э, получил денег. 
Если ты продал пять домов, то вам никто не скажет, что вам больше денег не будет выплачено, что это будет им не мора... аморально. Но мы не хотим, чтобы неправильные организации использовали деньги для мотивации людей, для того, чтобы люди производили больше или новаторство больше проявляли. Мы реагируем на идею о том, что каждый, денег, каждый получит больше денег, помогая другим. Нет, мы так не думаем. И, не, и люди, когда зарабатывают деньги и не помогают другим, никто на них не сердится. Вы хотите заработать 50 миллионов долларов, продавая жестокие игры детям. Вас, о вас будут говорить в журналах, будут говорить о вашем успехе, сколько денег вы заработали. Но если вы заработаете миллион долларов человеку, который решал серьезные проблемы, преодолевал препятствия, и вы скажете, и, например, нищета в Москве, или найти дом для каждого бездомного в Москве, или для ребенка без родителей, для сирот, для сирот. Вам скажут, что вы паразит, вы злой человек, вы хотите таким образом заработать деньги. Это система наших ценностей. Вот этот этический, код, этический кодекс имеет побочные результаты. Мы можем преуспевать, и нам могут платить много денег, нам и нашим семьям, если мы работаем в обычных компаниях. Либо, либо мы будем хорошо работать в, не, в некоммерческом секторе, но не получать деньги. Вот какой выбор мы должны будем сделать. И об этом думают лучшие умы в университетах. И только Господу известно, сколько людей может изменить ситуацию в некоммерческом секторе, если они будут работать в некоммерческом секторе так же, как работают в других компаниях. И они, они понесут коммерческие убытки, есть финансовые убытки, конечно, но они изменят ситуацию. Журнал Business Week провел исследование, пытаясь разобраться в том, как ваше вознаграждение влияет на ваш бизнес. Специалисты занимались этим исследованием 10 лет после того, как они закончили колледж. И вот компенсация за компенсацию выпускнику Гарвардской бизнес-школы после 10 лет его 400 тысяч для Стэнфорда 380 тысяч вот такую зарплату они получали а компенсация гендиректору мужчине 175 миллионов долларов для женщины генерального директора 149 тысяч долларов 80 долларов для борьбы с голодом и для работы с молодежью 78 тысяч. То есть ты не можешь привлечь сюда много людей, которые могут заработать 400 тысяч долларов в год, привлечь их к деятельности, за которую они получат генеральным директором в некоммерческом организации, которая борется с голодом. Они будут терять до, 380, до 320 тысяч долларов каждый год. Почему? Потому что... Почему они не будут там работать? Потому что у них нет сердца? Нет, не потому. Здесь математика неизбежна. Гораздо легче этому человеку дать 100 тысяч долларов каждый год в этой организации, которая борется с голодом. Я работаю... Я работаю с голодом помимо того, что я занимаюсь моей обычной работой. За это у вас будут налоги снижены в США. Вы дадите 100 тысяч долларов, но вы будете зарабатывать каждый год больше на 180 тысяч, если бы вы стали гендиректором компании некоммерческой, которая занимается борьбой с голодом. Критики говорят, но вы упускаете важный вопрос. То есть вы будете чувствовать себя прекрасно, вы будете удовлетворены, если вы будете помогать другим. И вот это вот прекрасное чувство, которое позволяет нам привлечь самых лучших людей, которые заканчивают университеты. Но а что позволит вам удержать их, мотивировать их делать больше? 
ну, вы скажете, что да, это хорошее чувство. Прекрасное чувство позволяет привлечь э, ва, к вашей деятельности лучших людей. Да, конечно, много хороших чувств. Когда вы зарабатываете 400 тысяч долларов, или когда вы дадите 50, 25 тысяч или 50 тысяч э, на борьбу с голодом или с нищетой, и все общество будет вас хранить, хвалить, потому что вы дали 50 тысяч или 25 тысяч долларов на благотворительность. Да, вот это вот хорошее чувство является привлекательным, когда вы занимаетесь неправительственной некоммерческой деятельностью. Если вы в обычной компании работаете, что там нет этого чувства? Те люди, которые работают в Apple, что, они плохо себя ощущают? Они каждый день приходят на работу и не испытывают счастье. iPad никак не влияет на образование. iPhone никак не меняет, например, что жизнь слепого или Starbucks. Ну, как он помогает фермерам, которые выращивают кофе в различных странах, или Lego? Как они развивают чувство дизайна и архитектуры у детей? То есть даже банк. Банк, который помогает молодой семье купить свой первый дом. Люди, которые работают в этом э, банке, что они, плохо себя ощущают? То есть э, молодежь может идти работать куда угодно и накопить огромный опыт, изменить ситуацию в мире. Э, ну, например, э, акции на бирже. Э, трудно, например, некоммерческим компаниям привлекать их людей, этих людей к себе своей деятельности. Это зарплаты э, людей, которые э, в 2016 году э, ассоциация мускулярной дистрофии, лейкемия, ассоциация, Common, э, ассоциация по, фонд по борьбе с раком груди, американские э, ассоциация по борьбе с раком и ассоциация Альцгаймер. Это сколько они платят своим лидерам? Видишь, 856 тысяч долларов. Огромные деньги. И вы можете прочитать в новостях. Вы думаете, что благодаря вашей донорской помощи эта болезнь будет вылечена? И этот э, репортер, например, выявил, что примерно полмиллиона долларов они будут выплачивать в качестве бонусов. И вот там будет сказано, ничего там не будет говориться о той ценности, которую эти деньги генерировали. Или э, могли бы произвести, если вы бы дали эти деньги гендиректору просто. Конечно же, вы разозлитесь. Но давайте посмотрим на эти зарплаты, которые получают люди в некоммерческих организациях. Давайте посмотрим на здравоохранение. Это вся организация, занимающаяся здравоохранением. И сравним с основными гендиректорами в, частных, в частном здравоохранении и в страховании. Мы все еще говорим о здравоохранении, о детях с лейкемией, о престарелых, которые не могут купить лекарства. Видите, это зарплаты э, людей, CEO, Сигна 21 миллион долларов, Айт на 18 миллионов долларов. Это не включает сюда персонал этих компаний. Так вот, лидеры э, в благотворительной деятельности в общем и целом получили 3 миллиона долларов. Э, и, и страхование здоровья 92 миллиона долларов. 192 миллиона долларов, то есть в 30 раз больше. Но это зарплаты, о чем же, на которые жалуется наше общество. Это зарплата, на которые осуществляются моральные нападки нашего общества. Вот это менеджмент, институализация болезни. В 30 тысяч больше тратятся на институализацию, на страхование, чем на борьбу. Вы можете посмотреть какие суммы э, вселяют в нас комфорт э, в нашем обществе в той и другой области. Ну, критики могут сказать. Неправильное сравнение. Ну, вам, может быть, не нравится, что эти должностные лица такие деньги получают. 
но они управляют огромнейшими компаниями. Вы не можете сравнить их с зарплатой, с зарплатой, которые э, работают в маленьких благотворительных компаниях. Красный Крест США – это мультимиллионер. Это, это организация мульти, мультимиллионер. Конгресс США э, обвинял Гил Магавера, их гендиректора, за то, что он 500 тысяч долларов получает в год. Не сравнить даже с этими четырьмя э, зарплатами. А у него огромная организация. Клуб Boys and Girls, который работает с детьми в США. Также мульти, организация мультимиллионер. Когда CNN сообщила, что их лидер зараба, заработал в один год 800 тысяч долларов, не говоря о том, что... Э, не, не говоря о других вещах. Так вот этот... Она, этот лидер, оставила свою должность, уволилась, потому что она получила 800 тысяч долларов в год, несмотря на то, что она в три раза увеличила доход от полумиллиарда долларов до полутора миллиардов долларов в год и увеличила в два раза количество детей, с которыми они работали. Теперь, что касается зарплат в благотворительные пяти благотворительных лидеров и э, известные телезвезды. Итак, опять же, Эндерсер Купер, CNN, 12 миллионов долларов в год, Стивер Кольбер, 15 миллионов долларов, Стефанополис, 15 миллионов в год, Джадж Джуди, вы видели передачу Джадж Джуди, Судья Джуди, это телешоу, когда люди приходят в суд, она судья и и можно сказать, вы говорите, вы, я заплатила вам за стиральную машину, а вы мне машину не поставили. Это судья Джуди решает, кто прав, кто виноват. Она получает 47 миллионов в год, решая спор о стиральной машине. Дидженерес 77 миллионов долларов в год. И опять же, лидеры благотворительной деятельности в общем и целом получили, сообща, 3 миллиона. А телезвезды в 55 раз больше. 55 раз больше. Они говорили людям, сообщали людям плохие новости. Они не пытались положить конец этим плохим новостям, источник этих плохих новостей. Я не пытаюсь быть смешным. Я не пытаюсь сказать, что давайте платить людям, которые занимаются в ней благотворительной деятельностью, столько же, сколько телезвездам, вне зависимости от того, чего они достигают. Нет, эти двойные стандарты, от них надо избавляться. Нельзя э, несерьезно подходить к деньгам, когда речь заходит о благотворительной деятельности. Э, не, э, надо использовать деньги стратегически, надо мотивировать генерирование новых э, ценностей, мотивации. Э, нельзя просто основываться на добром сердце человека. Критики могут сказать, но это очень опасный путь. Мы не хотим, чтобы лидеры в некоммерческом секторе начали подражать или использовать практику вознаграждений, которая используется в большом бизнесе или в, э, телеви, на телевидении. Но нам большой путь при, при, предстоит преодолеть, прежде чем мы хотя бы при, приблизимся к этому. Давайте удвоим зарплаты э, э, в благотворительной сфере. Вы видите, у, давайте утроим эти зарплаты. Давайте в четыре раза увеличим зарплаты, которые получают лидеры благотворительной деятельности. Ну, может, могут сказать, ну да, есть какой-то смысл в этом. Мы можем на 5% увеличить зарплату нашего лидера, если он чего-то добивается. Если вы станете платить на на 400 процентов больше то тогда это будет действительно неравная картина в сша люди скажут вы не можете платить много денег людям работающим в благотворительной секторе это не незаконно неправильно это у нас есть тренер по футболу в мичигане в университете он заработал 9 миллионов долларов тренер по баскетболу опять же в университете Дюк благотворительный университет 7 миллионов долларов они, он получил это, это тренеры университетских команд некоммерческие, некоммерческие команды 
И каждый из них получил э, 10 в, э, тренеров в университетских канат, в общем, получили 6 миллионов в год. Но они ценны, скажете вы. Но а как можно определить их ценность? Как ее измерить? Мы, ну, если футбольная команда победила, то тогда э, будут э, больше денег давать этой команде. Э, э, вот мы видим, какую ценность генерирует э, тренер по американскому футболу в благотворительном контексте. Это можно измерить? Как измерить ту ценность, которую производит мужчина или женщина, борясь с раком или работая с бездомными? У нас есть двойные стандарты здесь. Until the last dollar you spend no longer produces any value. You know, I was watching Russian TV last night. All kinds of commercials for, for KFC and for cat food and for cars. But we don't like nonprofit organizations to spend money on advertising. Our attitude to the nonprofit organization is, look, if you can get that advertising donated for free, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning when everyone's asleep, I'm okay with that, but I don't want my donation spent on advertising. I want it to go to the children, or I want it to go to the poor. Not understanding the fact that if you did it correctly, the money spent on advertising could dramatically increase the amount of money available to the poor or to the children. I showed you the AIDS rides in the breast cancer three days, right? I showed you that we raised $581 million in nine years. You know how we did that? By taking out full-page ads in the big American newspapers, by buying prime-time television advertising and radio advertising, and paying full price for it, so that we could get those ads placed where we wanted, when we wanted, directed at the audience we wanted them directed to, the same way Coca-Cola and Apple get to do it. <clears throat> in a, a, a liberal estimate, charity in the United States on an annual basis spends about $1.5 billion on marketing versus $729 billion for the rest of the economy. Or another way to think about that is for every one message that you see out in your day, asking you to give money to a charity. Every time you see one message, you are going to see 479 messages asking you to buy cat food, asking you to go to a movie, asking you to buy a new car, asking you to buy a new watch, asking you to buy new high heels, asking you to buy new shampoo. So the consumer brands, the for-profit sector, just drowns out the non-profit sector. It's got this big booming voice, and the nonprofit sector has this little whisper. Or if you want to look at it on a, uh, on a micro level, in 2016, our, our nonprofit, Save the Children, spent $5.4 million on advertising to try and tell Americans, here's what Save the Children does, so that more Americans would donate to Save the Children. Meanwhile, McDonald's spent $1.5 billion just on marketing to tell Americans alone, look at how good our hamburgers are so that you would buy more hamburgers. Or uh, cancer and cosmetics. Our Breast Cancer Foundation, the Susan Komen Foundation, last year spent about $1.2 million on advertising versus L'Oreal, the cosmetics company, two billion dollars on marketing trying to get you to buy more makeup and eyeliner and shampoo and all kinds of other things. Or candy and malnutrition. Feeding America, the largest American charity for trying to um, feed people in the United States who don't have food. They spent 3.2 million dollars on advertising trying to bring in more donations so they could feed more children. M&M Mars, the candy company, 
$1.1 billion trying to build market demand for children to buy more chocolate. So you see how loud the voice of hamburgers and chocolate is and how quiet the voice of end cancer and end hunger is. How loud the voice of shampoo is and how quiet the voice is of do something for orphans. Now, those numbers are important in light of this overarching contextual fact. Even though it's big, charitable giving has remained stuck at 2% of gross domestic product in the United States ever since we started measuring it back in the 1970s. That's an important fact because it tells us that in 45 years, the nonprofit sector in the U.S. has not been able to take any market share away from the for-profit sector. And if you think about it, well, how could one sector take market share away from another sector if you have told it you cannot market? There was a famous Harvard economist named John Kenneth Galbraith, and he used to say that the for-profit sector creates wants. It creates desires that you didn't know you had. You didn't know you needed Apple AirPods until about three years ago. Now all of a sudden you have to have Apple AirPods, right? It would be considered corporate malfeasance for Apple to launch the new iPhone without telling you about it. Without a massive advertising budget to let the whole world know, hey, the new iPhone is here. Look at all the great new things the new iPhone does. But those of you who work for nonprofit organizations are somehow expected to tell the general public about all of the good that you do so that you can bring in more donations, so that you can do more good without ever actually spending any money to tell the general public these things. You know, I was giving a speech in a very poor community in the United States, in, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And they brought all of the big players together, business, government, nonprofits, universities, and they studied the problem of poverty in that community. And they issued a big, fat, thick report. And on the cover of that report, they asked the question, how do we create a community of caring? How do we create a community of compassion? You know, sometimes it just seems hopeless. How do we get people to care? They don't seem to care as much as we need them to care. This is not a difficult question. How do you create a community of compassion the same way we created a community of consumption? We invested in it massively with billions and billions and billions of dollars a year screaming at people to go see the latest movie or buy the newest jeans and left the nonprofit sector unable to compete with that gigantic voice. You want to create a community of compassion? Start letting the nonprofit sector speak as loudly to the general public as you let KFC and McDonald's. You drive down the streets here in Moscow, what do you see? Do you see help the orphans, help the orphans, help the orphans? No. You see McDonald's, KFC, McDonald's, KFC, McDonald's, KFC. And then we wonder why we don't have a more compassionate community in the United States or in Russia. The third area of discrimination is risk-taking in the fundraising area, in the area that I just talked about. And so here again, the for-profit sector gets the advantage. You know, if Disney wants to make a lot of money, Disney goes out and they make a new $200 million movie. Do they know whether that movie's going to succeed or fail? No, they don't know. They only know after it's made. And sometimes they make $200 million movies that flop, like A Wrinkle in Time or Ben-Hur. <clears throat> but we give them permission to do that. We give them permission to experiment. And that's how they build these big enterprises. But imagine if you did what I just said. You launched a, an ad campaign for a charity for orphans, and you spent a million dollars on it, right? Nothing compared to the $200 million Disney will spend testing a movie, but still a lot of money for a charity. And you spent that million dollars on advertising and it didn't work. People would expect you to go to prison. That's how little tolerance we have for taking risk and experimenting with growth in the nonprofit sector. 
You know, innovation, everybody talks about innovation these days. It's the big, big word in business. Well, innovation comes down to something very simple. If you prohibit failure, you just killed innovation. If people are afraid to make mistakes, they're not going to innovate. If you can't innovate in the area of fundraising, you can't raise more money. You can't get new donors. You can't grow. Well, if you can't grow, you can never solve gigantic social problems that require you to grow, you know, that are much larger than you are. The fourth area is time. Here again, the for-profit sector gets the advantage. You know, a company like Amazon can go for years and years without earning any profit because it's a long-term proposition to build market dominance. But if a nonprofit organization ever took six years trying to raise its profile in the community with no money going to the cause, again, we would expect people to go to prison. <clears throat> and then the final area, the fifth area, is profit itself. So here again, the for-profit sector gets the advantage. The for-profit sector can pay people money in order to attract their money to test out all, all their brilliant new ideas. You know, here, you want, you want $3 billion to go test out Uber? Here, it's $3 billion. You need $5 billion to test Alibaba? Here's $5 billion. Oh, Elon Musk, you got Tesla. You need another $5 billion for Tesla? Here's another $5 billion. Oh, and you want to start a space company? Here's $3 billion for that. The capital markets provide all of this money for all of this experimentation, right, to test out your wildest ideas. But the nonprofit sector can only use the donation as a financial instrument. Donors don't want their donations spent on risky, crazy new things. So the for profit sector monopolizes the gigantic capital markets, and the nonprofit sector is starved for any kind of growth capital or experimentation capital. So if you put those five things together, if you're a nonprofit organization, you can't use money to lure talent away from the for-profit sector. That's immoral. You can't advertise on anywhere near the scale that the for-profit sector does to tell the general public about what you do so you can grow. That's wasteful. You can't take the kinds of risks that the for-profit sector takes trying to figure out new ways to bring in money, because if you do that, it means you're irresponsible. You don't have the same amount of time as the for-profit sector to find that money, because if you take too much time trying to find money without money going to the children, it means you don't really care about the children, and you don't have a stock market, you don't have a capital market with which to do any of that, even if you could in the first place. And with the best of intentions, with a good heart, believing that we're doing a good thing, we have actually put the nonprofit sector at an extreme disadvantage to the for profit sector on every single level. And then we wonder why aren't these organizations changing the world? <clears throat> this statistic is sobering. From 1970 to 2009, the number of new nonprofits in the United States that got really big, that got more than $50 million a year, was 144. Meanwhile, the number of for profits that did it was 46,000, over 46,000. So we have these enormous social problems, right? We need non the non nonprofit sector to get enormous as well. We need it to generate huge scale, but it can't generate any scale. All of the scale goes to the organizations that get to play by the more favorable rule book. They get to pay people what they're worth, they get to advertise, they get to take risks, they get to use capital. Now, <clears throat> this dysfunctional double standard gets held in place by this one really dangerous question, which is, what percentage of my donation goes to the cause versus overhead? Now, is that question asked in Russia? Do people ask a question like that in Russia? Do people want to know? Yes? Okay. All right, there are three big problems with this question. We think we're really smart when we ask this question. There are actually three categories of stupidity built directly into this question. The first is, it makes us think that overhead is somehow not part of the cause. 
But it absolutely is, especially if it's being used for growth. Who would say that the growth of a charity that takes care of orphans isn't related directly to the cause of helping orphans? <clears throat> now, this idea that overhead somehow steals from the cause or this idea that overhead somehow takes money away from the children, the idea that fundraising somehow takes money away from the children creates this second much bigger problem, which is it forces organizations to go without the overhead things they really need to grow in the interest of meeting all of this cultural pressure to keep overhead low. Charities just don't spend money to grow because they're afraid to. Because they're afraid that they'll be attacked by the media and the general public for doing it. So, for example, we've all been taught that a, that a nonprofit organization should spend as little as possible on overhead things like fundraising under the theory that, well, look, the less money I spend on fundraising, the less money I spend on that little silver sliver, the more blue there is for the cause, for the children, for the orphans, for the elderly, and that's what I want. I want as much money as possible to go to blue. I want as much money as possible to go to the children. Well, that makes sense if it's a very depressing world in which that pie can never be made any bigger. But if it's a logical world in which investments in fundraising actually raise more funds, then we have it precisely backwards. And we should be investing a great deal more in fundraising, even if it becomes a larger section of that pie, because fundraising is the one thing that has the potential to make the entire pie bigger, that has the potential to create enormously greater sums of blue than you could ever hope to achieve by just trying to shrink that silver sliver. I mean, you know how philanthropy got as big as it is in the United States? Investments in fundraising. And if there were no investments in fundraising made, it would still be tiny. Now, the problem is it's not nearly big enough. We need to spend more money on fundraising, but organizations are afraid to spend any more money on fundraising. In the same way, we've all been taught that the volunteer bake sale that only has 5% overhead, well, that's morally and economically superior to the professional fundraising enterprise with 40% overhead. I mean, look at how wasteful this organization is. Look at how much more money is going to the children from the bake sale, right? Wow, so much money going to the children from the bake sale. Well, maybe, but maybe not. What if we're missing an important piece of information? Like, what is the actual size of those pies? See, they always show us the pies at exactly the same size. So you're missing the most important piece of information, which is what is the size of the pies? Who cares if the bake sale only has 5% overhead if the thing is tiny? What if the bake sale only netted $71 for the cause because it made no investment in its growth and the professional fundraising enterprise netted $71 million for the cause because it did invest in its growth? Now, which pie looks like it's sending more money to the children? And I'll tell you something, that 40% in red that's spent on fundraising and overhead, that's not wasted money. That's not some evil. That's money invested in building civic engagement. That's money invested in getting people to care about things that they didn't know about. That's an investment in the strength of our society. That's not wasted money. I'll give you two examples. <clears throat> I told you about the AIDS rides. We started the AIDS rides with just $50,000 in risk capital. It wasn't easy to find when so many people were dying of AIDS. Donors wanted all their money going to those people with AIDS, not to some crazy fundraising scheme involving bicycles that had never been tested. Well, within nine years, we multiplied that 1,982 times into $108 million net after all expenses and unrestricted money for AIDS services. <clears throat> we then launched the Breast Cancer Three Days with an initial investment of just $350,000 in risk capital. 
And that money was no easier to find, despite the fact that we had already sort of proven this concept with the AIDS rides. Why was it not easy to find? Because there's no venture capital market for a nonprofit fundraising ideas. So if you want to figure out how to really use philanthropy effectively in Russia, start creating pools of capital. Start creating funds that the best nonprofit organizations can go to to ask for loans in order to stimulate their growth plans. <clears throat> the way we grew the breast cancer three days, the way we went from nothing to $194 million in five years was with loans. We asked Avon, the cosmetics company, to loan us money so that we could launch an event. The event netted a lot of money. We asked them for more money so that we could do two events, more money so we could do seven events, more money so we could do nine events, more money so we could do 13 events. And every year we paid them back the loan out of the growing size of the pies. So you need to establish funds that contribute to the growth of your nonprofit organizations. So in five years, we multiplied that 554 times into $194 million. Now, if you were a person really interested in breast cancer, say you're a wealthy donor and you're really interested in breast cancer, you have to ask yourself, what makes more sense? Find the best breast cancer researcher in the world, give her $350,000 and tell her I want all of it to go to breast cancer research, or give her fundraising department the $350,000 and tell them I want all of it to go into growth and turn that into $194 million for breast cancer research. And even if it didn't multiply by 554 the way it did in our case, if it only multiplied by two, right, $700,000 is twice as much money for breast cancer research as $350,000. Here's a very powerful example. We have an organization in the United States called Wounded Warrior Project, and they take care of veterans, veterans who have been injured physically or mentally in Iraq or in Afghanistan. Now, as of last year, Wounded Warrior Project was very big. It represented 40% of private philanthropy for veteran services in the United States. Now, here's what's amazing. 15 years ago, Wounded Warrior Project did not exist. There was no Wounded Warrior Project. How did they go from nothing to become 40% of private philanthropy for veteran services in just 15 years? Well, here's how they did it. In 2012, they spent about $1.5 million on fundraising. That generated $10 million in revenue. And there was $5.6 million left over for veterans after that. Overall overhead of 45%. And you might say, well, that's really high, 45% overhead. How can they get that overhead down? Because that's what they should do. They should get that overhead down. They asked a different question. The question they asked was, how many veterans are there in the United States that don't have mental health and job training services? How big would we need to get to serve all of them? And what would we need to spend on fundraising to get that big? So just six years, just uh, nine years later, they were spending $74 million a year just on fundraising. But that $74 million, like I said before, trying to compete with Coca-Cola, trying to compete with Apple, trying to get some of that money that's otherwise going to go to Coca-Cola and Apple, that generated $400 million in revenue with $262 million available for veteran services. Now imagine if they were just loyal to this religion that says you shouldn't spend money on fundraising. And they were trying to please the general public. And so they said, we're going to please what the general public wants, and we're not going to spend any more money on fundraising. They would still be giving $5.6 million a year to veterans, but because they decided to challenge that, because they decided to say, we have every bit as right to communicate with the general public on the level that Apple gets to communicate with them, now they're sending $262 million a year to veterans. This is an example of best practice. Don't get caught in the trap of thinking small and tiny. 
and thinking that that's doing anyone ever any good. Have the audacity to think as big as Facebook is thinking because you have every right to think that big. And the third piece of stupidity in that question, what percent of my donation goes to overhead first versus the cause, is it gives donors really bad information. So if you took two soup kitchens, right, two organizations that serve soup to the homeless, A and B, and A tells you 90 cents of every donation goes to soup, and B says, well, 70% of every donation goes to soup. Well, we've all been trained to think, well, that's easy. I'm going to give my money to soup kitchen A. Look at how much more efficient they are. They're a better organization, except you forgot to ask one question. And the question you forgot to ask is, what good are they actually doing? What if you actually went and visited the soup kitchens and you found that soup kitchen A is serving malnutritious soup to about 100 people a week in a rundown facility and they're closed half the time and their staff is really unfriendly? Right? Does the fact that they spend 90 cents of every dollar on the cause doesn't mean that their staff is friendly. Whereas Soup Kitchen B, because they've made investments in job training and overhead and growth, they're serving 5,000 people a week, hearty, nutritious soup in a state-of-the-art facility. Their staff is really friendly, and they're open all the time. Geez, now it's clear I should have given my money to Soup Kitchen B. So that silly little pie chart that only asks the question, what did it cost, what did it cost, what did it cost, would have betrayed you utterly and completely in terms of giving to the charity that's actually doing the best work. So I'm not saying don't ask any questions. I'm saying don't ask stupid questions. And that question about overhead is a stupid question that in the U.S. people have been trained to ask for 75 years and we're now in the process of trying to get them to ask a different question. And you have the opportunity, because philanthropy is young in Russia, to get people asking the right questions from the start. And the right question is, what impact is happening? What good is being done? How good are the services? How many people are they serving? Are they actually solving the problem? I'll let them spend whatever they want on overhead if they're actually solving the problem. And then the charities reinforce all of this by assuring the general public that we have low overhead. They have these little pie charts showing our low self-esteem, and then we have all of these little uh, certifications from watchdog agencies that say, this is a good charity because they spend very little money on overhead. Now, about six years ago, after a TED talk that I gave, three of the big watchdog agencies in America, three of the big agencies that had been telling the general public for years, ask about overhead, ask about overhead, ask about overhead, those three organizations issued a press release in which they said to the American public, to the donors of America, we write to correct a misconception about what matters when deciding which charity to support. The percent of charity expenses that go to administrative and fundraising costs, commonly referred to as overhead, is a poor measure of a charity's performance. Many charities should spend more on overhead. The people and communities served by charities don't need low overhead. They need high performance. Signed by our three biggest charity watchdogs. Charity Navigator, the Better Business Bureau, Wise Giving Alliance, and GuideStar. Now that's a huge change in the United States. But it's going to take a long time to get Americans to actually start listening to that. And that's something that we're actively working on. I'm going to finish up with um, this. This is a picture of the ribbon on the cover of a book I wrote called Uncharitable that is about these ideas. And, you know, I think you have them here, but in the United States we have all these different colored ribbons. There's, you know, there's one color for breast cancer and one color for leukemia and one color for AIDS. And I bought this piece of linen at a store in Hollywood where I was living at the time, and I ripped it apart and I found an oil stain in the street and I ground it in with my shoe until it became for me a symbol of desecration. A symbol of the desecration of our dreams on the altar of appearances. 
the desecration of our dreams on the altar of loyalty to an old way of thinking. The desecration of our dreams on the altar of complying with a thought system that we've never really thought about. And I think more than anything else, we need our nonprofit organizations to go after the wild-eyed dreams that got them into this work in the first place when they felt they had a critical role to play in society in eradicating the great social problems. You know, none of us wants our gravestones to read that we kept charity overhead low, right? We want our gravestones to read that we changed the world. And if we would have a generosity of thought, you know, it takes real generosity to change the way you think about something. Give away money, yeah, that's generous, that's nice, but to change the way you think about something, something you've been self-righteous about, when you actually begin to understand that it's wrong, when you actually begin to understand that it isn't serving anyone, that's real generosity. Это, вот это щедрость. И если у нас такая щедрость будет, то тогда НКО будут играть критическую роль в изменении мира, в интересах всех граждан, которые нуждаются в этих переменах. И большая честь быть здесь с вами в Москве. Надеюсь, что я вернусь еще сюда. Могу лишь похвалить всех тех, кто работает в в НКО, пытаясь решать все эти проблемы. Всем вам спасибо. Learn about a different way of making a difference. If, uh, if you want to reach me, I try to respond to every communication I get. You can reach me at that email address or there on Twitter. I'd be happy to talk to you. And I believe we have time for questions now. So I think there's a moderator. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Palota, for your great speech. Уважаемые дамы и господа, аплодисменты Дэн Палота. Let's applaud. Let's applaud Дэн Палота. Дамы и господа, у нас находится микро. We have mic just in the middle of our meeting room, and you can ask your question. But please introduce yourself, and then we'll give you a personal answer. Hello. My name is Katya. Thank you very much for your presentation. You're welcome. Uh, a few years ago, I, I watched your presentation on YouTube, and I was shocked. A couple of years ago, I saw your presentation on YouTube. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, a uh, few years ago, I uh, followed your presentation on YouTube about this new approach. Probably the question is very important. That's why the equipment is not working. For the third time. A few years ago, I followed your uh, presentation on YouTube, and you described this new approach, and I was pleasantly shocked because it's a progressive method, not only uh, thinking, but it's about how uh, uh, non-commercial organizations shall help each other. And it would be great, I thought, at that time for each, um, for each and every who works in uh, a non-commercial organization to uh, get familiar with your presentation. Now you are in Russia. Dream, dreams come true. But how presently each of us can generate change following your new approach? Just for each and every person who heard your words to do something for these changes. I hope that you will come to Russia again and again. audience, they can stop asking the question about overhead, and they can start asking the nonprofits that they love, what are your dreams, and what can I do 
to help you make those dreams come true? What, fi what financial, what can I fund that will help you make those dreams come true? Then the larger question is, how do you change minds, right? How do you change the way people think about something like this? Well, that's hard work. It's very, very hard work, and it can take a lot of time. So in the United States, we've created something called the Charity Defense Council. And the Charity Defense Council is systematically trying to change the way the American public thinks about these things by um, responding to media stories that don't get it right, um, by taking out big billboards. We have, we have big billboards uh, in Massachusetts when somebody's driving by, the billboard says, don't ask if a charity has low overhead. Ask if it has big impact. The American public has never seen anything like that before. So we need to start to do that on a bigger scale. But inside, if any of you are on the board of a nonprofit organization or the staff of a nonprofit organization, or you donate to a nonprofit organization, start looking at what can we do over the course of the next year or two or three to change the, the small world around us, our, our donors and our volunteers. What can we do to start changing their thinking? And maybe it's you could show them my TED Talk or we're actually uh, working on a documentary film, a 90-minute film about these ideas. And I actually, we're, I think we might use some of the film from today, might go into that film. So that will be another tool that people can use. But you have to start to develop strategies for changing thinking instead of just accepting it. You know, we can't just throw up our hands and say, well, that's the way people think. There's nothing we can do about the way people think. You know, there was a time in the United States when people thought that women shouldn't vote. A lot of hard work was done and changed the way people think about that. We've changed the way people think about seat belts. We've changed the way people think about smoking. We just have to stop thinking that it's hopeless and start committing ourselves to doing the things we need to do to change it. And it will change. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Next question. First of all, let me thank you for this brilliant lecture. I, of course, share your opinion on this subject, and I think this is very important to involve more people for this method. And, um, but um, uh, for my question, please imagine um, two kinds of people. The first man is a very rich businessman, and uh, he's not good in charity. He thinks the charity is bad, he just agist, he's thinking about his business. He's, um, um, he has a big company, very rich, very big. And the second man is poor, yes, but uh, he's very good in charity. He shares most of his money that he don't have much, but on uh, his friends, on other people, on some poor people, uh, given um, food for homeless and etc. Yes, um, most of people will think about first man that he's bad, he's egoist. Uh, they're angry with him. Yes, but uh, about the second man, they will they will glad to see him. They will uh, congratulate him for his doing. Yes, uh, so the first of men. Um, for most of people will be bad, the second good. But what I'm trying to say, uh, you were showing us... Which that, man are you? What? Um, <laughs> are you very wealthy? You have a lot of money? Uh, no, I, I, in the middle. Okay. I'm in the middle. Uh, so um, you were showing us diagram where in Russia, in, in uh, USA, um, where uh, I think, uh, I don't remember... It's some 75 percent yep. uh, charity from individual yep. and um, other from commercial organization. But if we think um, about that um, big commercial organization gives not only money to charity, it gives uh, workplaces for many people, and they, these people will go to work, uh, will earn money, and from their salary, they can uh, do a charity. Yes. Of course. And um, do you 
um, how do you think will this diagram change? It will, will involve here the not only uh, direct spending money for charity, but um, will involve the, all these people that uh, get work with help of this organization. And they do a charity um, also. It's a, it's a brilliant question. I understand what Thank you're you. getting at. It's a very, very smart question. And I have a real problem. Look, I'm, I'm a big supporter of the nonprofit sector, right? I'm trying to liberate the nonprofit sector. But I have a real problem who think, with people who think that the only way you change the world is in the nonprofit sector. You know, corporations do enormous things to make the world a better place. Now, in some, place, in some cases, they do things to make the world worse. But if you look at the simple example of the refrigerated boxcar, the refrigerated railroad car, you know, back in the, I don't know, the 1920s or something, and you look at the difference that made in the world, how much foodborne illness, how much death was eliminated by the development of the refrigerated boxcar, you have to ask yourself in this age where we're all talking about social enterprise, was that a social enterprise? Interesting question. <clears throat> Is Apple a social enterprise? You know, Apple, look what the difference the iPhone has made in the lives of the blind. Look at what the iPad is doing for education. The Apple Watch, the new Apple Watch Series 4, it will do an electrocardiogram for your heart in 30 seconds. When I was little, I had a heart murmur. I used to have to go to the Massachusetts General Hospital once a year for a full day of tests with all kinds of things all over my body. The Apple Watch will do that in 30 seconds now just sitting on your wrist. Is Apple a social enterprise? You know, I, I'm on the, the school committee in my hometown, and we just passed a measure to get an extra million dollars for our schools in our hometown. We did that by educating the public. You know how we educated the public? I made a movie about all the things our schools needed. You know what I made the movie with? My iPhone. Now, if I didn't have the iPhone and iMovie, I couldn't have made that movie. I couldn't have gotten the million dollars for our schools. So there are some problems that only philanthropy can solve. You know, there are some problems that you can't monetize. Say, someone with an emotional or an intellectual disability who needs love and attention. Well, you need to raise philanthropy in order to hire people to provide that person with love and attention. And if you want to reach all of the people who suffer from uh, developmental disabilities, then you need to raise a lot more philanthropy. But people also make an enormous difference in the for-profit sector. Um, and if we can get more cooperation happening between the two, that's how we can solve some big problems. Thank you for your question. It was a wonderful question. Thank you. Спасибо за ваш вопрос, уважаемые гости. Dear guests, we don't have much time left, and uh, one more question. That's it. Thank you once again. Well, thank you for coming to Russia. Come to other regions of Russia. Russia is a big country. I have the following question. Is my understanding correct? You advise uh, Russia not uh, like in the U.S. because uh, the philanthropy in the U.S. has a long history. You advise uh, Russia to follow a different approach. Philanthropy is not small salary, is not uh, additional time besides your uh, normal work. It's not a small part of your uh, life. It's not a hobby, but it's a professional, uh, serious job. Uh, and which should be paid uh, accordingly during the entire life uh, and to people working there and those who finance these projects should see it this way. And second short question, how did you come to this idea, if my understanding is correct? Thank you. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that we, we have to remove the line between the for-profit sector and the non-profit sector. There should be no difference in the way we compensate people trying to end hunger and the way we compensate people trying to sell makeup. There should be no difference. 
so that everyone is incentivized, so that if you have really, really bright people coming out of college, they have an incentive to go work in the nonprofit sector. Now look, I'm not saying that we don't have the best and the brightest in the nonprofit sector, but we don't have nearly enough of them. And there are an enormous amount of very talented people who give away their best years in the for-profit sector because they simply don't want to give up the money that they'll make there to become the leader of a nonprofit organization. Now, how did I come to these conclusions? Well, when we started building the AIDS Rise and the Breast Cancer Three Days, we had enormous success. We were raising hundreds of millions of dollars, faster than anybody had ever done it before. And we were doing it by hiring the best people we could find and incentivizing them. We were doing it by spending a lot of money on advertising. We were doing it by taking risks with new ideas. And the media was criticizing us. Now, I hadn't written any of my books yet, and I hadn't thought about any of these things, and I hadn't given a TED Talk, and there was no consciousness about this issue. The media was attacking us. You're evil. That's money that should be going to women with breast cancer, not spent on television ads. That's money that should go to breast cancer, not to pay someone a high salary. Yes, but the high salary allows me to hire a talented person who knows how to take the money for the ads and use it to raise more money for breast cancer than anybody has ever done in the past. So doing these things that we were doing that, would be, that are completely normal in business, that would be utterly unremarkable in business, but in charity people were saying, you're an evil person, began to get me thinking that this whole thing is messed up. The whole way we think about this is killing people. It's keeping all of these organizations small when the problems are huge. That's how. Спасибо за ваш вопрос. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay, thank and you thank so you much, for sharing everybody. all your thank thoughts you very, and rich experience. Much. We are always waiting you here in Russia, and uh, I hope to see you more often here. Me too. Okay. Ваши аплодисменты, Дэн Палота. Дорогие друзья, нам нужно всего Dear friends, we need a couple of minutes for the next speaker. Come again in, in a couple of minutes.